Who's on by telephone? Do we know who it is? Mar no, Marion's on the Marion's on the telephone, oh, but I can see everybody because I just don't have a camera up on my computer screen. But nope. I can see all of you, and I'm t talking through my phone. So I remain invisible, but if you feel a presence around you during this meeting, hugging you and kissing you, it's ah. me. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so does everyone know everyone? Lorraine, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure, um, my name is Lorraine. I'm here in Long Island and I have a place up near Phoenicia and Shendaken. So I found out about the path work. Um, I don't know, it's probably going back about 20 years ago when I attended a yoga workshop that was held at the Pathwork Center. And then once I got a place up there, I wanted to find out more and I got involved with the Pathwork Center that was in Phoenicia. And I got to be friendly with um, Kelly and Wolfgang. I don't know if you know them. Sure. Phoenicia. So um, I was with that group for a while and uh, haven't been connected, but when I saw this topic and I started to read the lecture, it really hit me as something that I need to attend. So um, that's that's what's happening here. Right. Well, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, so let's talk about the lecture. I'll just give my, my first impressions. This lecture, uh, claiming the total capacity for greatness, that sounds a little daunting, I think. And, uh, you know, it reminds me of that quote that um, some people attributed to Nelson Mandela, but then they said it was actually Marion Williamson, you know, who said that the thing that we're most afraid of is really our greatness and our power and our realizing our potential. And I think that that really rings true. Um, and so the guy does tackle in this, in this lecture the question of why we are ready or prepared to kind of stand our own greatness. Why, are we, why don't we want to kind of grab the greatness that we do feel that we have? Because uh, key to what the guide often says that, um, you know, we, we have this already. We're already there. We just, we sense that it's in us and that we sense that we are it. Yet, however, there's a barrier to actualizing it here. Um, here in, in our earth, on this earth plane where we are. And I think that's because of, of course, the inertia that we're subject to. And it's also, of course, because of the ego. So in this lecture, you know, the guide really puts forward two competing, the two competing parts of the self. The little, little ego that's gonna think about uh, winning, triumphing, being better than others, and then the greater self that's not concerned about, about those things. And so the lecture is sort of about the, the vicious circle. There's two, there's two circles, a vicious circle and a benign circle. And then the lecture is about this key concept of transformation. In other words, one energy current. That uh, another, something that's also mentioned here in the lecture that is so, uh, so straight up, is the great energy and power that's locked into quote unquote evil. And if we are able to realize that that energy can be converted into the positive energy, we don't need to lose any of that powerful energy. You know, we can liberate that energy and that strength and turn it into a different direction. Um, and at the top of, of page four, the guide says, um, well, actually I wanna back up on, on the bottom of page three, there's two or three quotes uh, from the lecture that I picked up on. One is, um, another obstruction to the realization of your own ultimate unique beauty, greatness, your genius, is your fear of still existing evil within yourself. And then the money quote here, which is, all fear is ultimately the fear of that. Hmm. So that is such a powerful phrase, right? right. All, all fear, all fear, is what, what is it? It's the fear of still existing evil within ourselves. So, you know, this is the pathwork point of view, which is, is sort of controversial, right? It's that the evil isn't outside. There's nothing outside that can harm us. It's all, the evil that we encounter is all self-created. It all comes from the still existing evil within that we are afraid of confronting and exposing. So, also in this lecture, you know, there are, there's this meditation called the gateways, 
which uh, I think is, is well known. But mm -hmm. meditation talks about the negative aspects and how to transform them or what the positive aspects are. And that is like so valuable, I think. And I'll just read those at the top of page five. He says, each duality, each mutually exclusive opposite you meet as an obstruction is a sign that you're still divided. You are split off from your deeper consciousness, split off in fear, pride, self-will, ignorance, greed, and hate. And then these same aspects can be reversed. Fear becomes faith and trust. Now that's very interesting, isn't it? Because what's, what's he getting at there? I think the idea is that fear is also caution, prudence, Fear becomes faith and trust. Pride becomes humility. Self-will, a supple, resilient, flexible, giving in, going with attitude. And a finely attuned flexibility to flow with your rhythm of life. Ignorance becomes awareness. Perception, understanding, and wisdom. Greed. What is greed? What's the positive aspect of greed? Are you sitting down? A special kind of trust that lets you reach out and know there is abundance for you in every way. And you will have abundance, so that greed will be ludicrously superfluous. Most significantly, your hate will turn into your power of love. So I really think that there are a few things in the pathwork that are as valuable of doing this comparison between the negative aspects and the positive aspects, how one really can transform and become the other. To me, that's so crucially, critically valuable. Um, I know that when you're afraid, you're supposed to whistle a happy little tune, right? But when you're afraid, you say, hey, wait a second. It's not out there. It's within me, what I'm not accepting or understanding. So, um, Let's have some let's have some discussion about these aspects. Um, what do you feel about uh, the subject of this lecture, uh, ladies and gentlemen? Um, any thoughts? Well, I was working with something that you didn't mention. I have it on here on my iPhone, but I'm not going to look for it. And that was the how you get past the evil that you think is inside of you. And from what I understand, you really have to. I accept it. I think it's, correct me if I'm wrong. I might. You know, I only read it once. That you have to look at it, and kind of, I guess, in some way, accept it. Because how can you look at it before? So, as I understand, getting past that is what opens you up to be able to see the other side. Right. Well, there's there's a very important way that the pathwork sees that in the middle of page one. He says. Um, Got it on. You have to allow your negativities to surface. Oh, it's Beverly. I don't know. I enabled a waiting room for some reason. No, no. You have to have a waiting room. You have to have it now. They put it on. Oh, I didn't know that. All right. Yeah. Hey, Beverly. Hi. Greetings. Greetings. Hey, Beverly. <laughs> Good evening. Hi, Kay. Hi. Hello. Hi. I just asked Alan a question, and he's just answering it, having to uh, do with getting through the evil in the culture. The guide says a vague and general awareness of destructive and evil intents does not suffice for the transformation work to take place. Exactly. He says, okay, you allow your negativities to surface, you accept them and take full responsibility for them. Next sentence, a vague and general awareness of destructive and evil intents does not suffice for the transformation work to take place. The negative negativities must be full. Hold on, hold on. Somebody should mute. Everybody should mute. Mute. No Let's all mute. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's like, I didn't get it. I'd like you to repeat who's got, it. Who's got the background noise going on there? I don't know. It's nice and quiet here. Alan, you're able to, um, you're able to mute everybody from your end. I, I am. I am. Let's see. Oh. There's some loud talking happening. Sounds like a bird. Does anybody have a bird? 
what makes them come up. Okay, I muted everybody. Now, that's it. <laughs> anyway, what I was saying was that just continuing with um, what he says on page one, the negativities must be fully seen in all their details. Fear and shame of them must be overcome. Hiding and camouflaging or whitewashing must be, have stopped. Exaggerated self-blame must be relinquished. What is necessary is simply and honestly to own up to the full force of devilish attitudes and to all their puny details. Only this act will free you. So um, I'm going to unmute you. Okay, right. I'm, I just want to finish with one other question based on that. It came to me that, that that's a very difficult thing to do, to face, not face your, the evil that you think is inside of you. But here's the other question. Is that we are one consciousness, right? We're one consciousness. Does that sort of imply... Oh, somebody just came on with that noise. Mm -hmm. um, does that imply that whatever evil has happened, that in some way we are responsible as one consciousness to what has happened in the past? To us as human beings, yeah. Can, can we investigate that question a little? I mean, one thing I want to emphasize about what I just read is that even the ego can have a good time and enjoy the process of investigating um, the negative. Even wow. the ego can be prideful about it. You know, that's what the guide means when he says, um, the act is by no means a morbid or self-negating process, but he says, um, yeah, exaggerated self-blame must be relinquished. So in other words, if, if you're revealing negativities in a kind of egotistic way, hey, you know, these negativities really make me special, or, mm -hmm. um, you know, hey, I'm so bad because I have these negativities. Um, and that's the ego playing tricks, you know, because I think that we have to approach and embrace this process of self-exposure in a very humble way. Um, and, you know, I never cease to be amazed by, in our groups in the center, how the deeper, the deepest negativities that people reveal immediately became something that everybody else could relate to. Something that uh, seems embarrassing, seems shameful, all of a sudden seems ordinary and relatable. In other words, there's no special excitement or cachet in our negativity, even though the ego would like to create that. Got it. Good answer. Got it. All right, um, more thoughts. What do you think, Frank? I was just thinking that uh, all human beings have this trait of one side being good, one side being evil. But where did this all come from? Is this a learning thing or is this something that's innate in us when we're born to have evil and good? Well, I think the guy says, the guide says that we come into this incarnation where we are now with some aspects that are purified and others that are not. In other words, some parts of us that are connected to God and others that are not. I mean, for example, let's say you might have a beautiful talent in terms of art. You might have a beautiful talent in terms of music. You might have a wonderful ability to relate to your sister, let's say. But in some other aspects, there's evil, there's resentment, there's fury and, and hate. So it's not that, it's that some aspects are, are, are not purified and others are purified. And of course, the bigger question about evil, you know, to go back to the whole cosmology of the path work, you know, that we all um, fell from grace, fell from God, fell from the oneness and the, the, the unity and the the oneness of being where there are no conflicts and um, we fell because of an act of rebellion or pride and we're trying to work our way back 
So the evil is sort of a part of our condition and the guide says this in, in almost every lecture, the guide says, um, to the degree that you feel joy and happiness and richness in your life, you are, you feel purification, you feel closer to God. The gauge of the path work, he says, what is your life manifestation telling you? How rich and full is your life? How much are joy, peace, and abundance increasingly open to you? How much less are you afraid and reluctant to meet and expose the deepest regions of your innermost self? But a third, a third thing I would say is that everybody that comes to a path of self-exploration is has has grown a lot um has grown a lot in terms of the evil that is unconscious and ignorant that doesn't understand the need even for a path like this so anyone who is grappling with these issues has a evil has a lot less hold on that person mm, nice point thank you alan Tracy, are you there? I am here. You like this lecture. You helped me pick I know. it up. I like all the lectures. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've yet to meet one that I don't like. Are you asking me a question, Alan? Yeah. You have, what are your thoughts about it? Um, well, I think... I think what I believe is that the, the universal consciousness or the God consciousness has an inherent quality, which is that it wants to spread, sort of like the universe. It's always expanding and spreading. And in order to do that, it manifests in different circumstances, anywhere from a gas or rocks, plants, animals, all the way up to human beings. So I think what happens is that evil comes from fear and that as soon as you become separated from the universal consciousness, which is an inherent process that you have, that one goes through in order to manifest and experience itself in different forms, that that separation causes fear. And the fear is what triggers the evil. So I, I, I guess I, I kind of more in the Mir Baba camp with, with this than, which, which would just, which would really, expound that this is a natural evolutionary cycle that's inherent in the spreading of the divine consciousness throughout the, the, the universe. Because when you see, when, when an entity sees itself as separated, which we all, we all still do at this level of manifestation, that is inherently going to cause fear. And then that triggers a self-protection, which causes the evil. Well, I'm just going to say one thing. The Course in Miracles says that we made that choice. And the Course in Miracles, again, says that the, the, the reason we feel evil is because we feel guilty about the choice we made. Now, I don't know how, what, what the, if that connects with the password. But I'm trying to connect what you're saying with, yes, the fear, the separation causes the fear. That makes it clear. But why is there separation? 
I think I think it's an inherent necessary evolutionary step to spread divine consciousness because I think the divine consciousness is like a pulsating mass and it has certain properties associated with it and one is this inherent characteristic to spread and as it pulsates and 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 hits the edge of the void where where it has the farthest that it has gone before it parts of it break off so i think i believe i think i'm not i'm not sure that it's not something that we actually chose but that it's a casualty of war <laughs> or a necessary price that has to be paid in order to accomplish the overall task, which is the spreading of divine consciousness throughout the entire universe, throughout everything. Okay. I think that there are these theories or conceptualizations about, you know, where we came from and the fall of the angels and the spreading of the creative spark life into the void. And, and they are different ways of looking at it, um, but they're all beautiful and very valuable. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, certainly here, there's a lot of separation on earth and we are challenged in ways to heal those splits. So, um, and when people are afraid, I think they seek comfort and they seek contact, right? Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes with, with people of only like-minded people. I'm, uh, I'm sort of struck by the idea, the image of all these people with the virus uh, being alone and not being able to be with family because they're all in isolation. I know. It's sort of uh, hellish, really. It's like one of those uh, bad spiritual spheres that the guide would talk about, you know, where people right. think of isolation and pain and, and individual suffering. Right. Right. I think there's a, there is a pathwork lecture that talks about this, and we have done it before. Uh, I, I'm going to try and find it again. We have done it before, maybe a year or a year and a half ago, about this, this, the way that this divine consciousness, when it hits the edge of the void, splinters off and for a certain period of time loses its connection with, with, with the mass, with the pulsating mass and becomes differentiated. And that causes duality. It's, it's it and it's the, the other. Right. And therein lies the beginning of the journey back, you know, to Oz. I'm here through Oz back to home. It's, it's like, you know, sort of, I always think of Dorothy because she had to go to Oz to figure out that there was no place for her like home. She would never have figured that out without going to Oz. Right. So that's a very good metaphor. I mean, needless to say, as my dad would have said, you know, all these uh, the seminal stories are all very spiritually, they're spiritual metaphors. Right. The Wizard of Oz is a spiritual metaphor, the hero with a thousand faces, the quests, you know, that, that, that you go on. All these very meaningful stories that people love are real metaphors, right? Right. And the Wizard of Oz is a very good one. Right. And there's some sort of like inherent, there's some sort of, it's like something was wrong with Dorothy because she didn't realize that from the beginning. But I don't think so. I, I think that the, that it's like you, you don't know if you're going to want something until you try it. It's like, it's like expecting, expecting a person or any entity to, to know what's, at the end of a journey before they even take the first step. So I, I, I don't think there's so, so much fault there. We, we, we tend to assign, starting with ourselves, and I'm very bad at that too, you know, fault that somehow we're, you know, starting with like that we, that we screwed up right from the beginning because we, we chose to separate ourselves from the divine consciousness and then, you know, did that fall of the angels, whatever. And now we're spending the next gazillion, you know, in manifestations, incarnations, trying to work our way back to where we started. But I don't think it's quite like that. I, I think that 
it's it's a necessary part of the journey to accomplish the bigger goal of spreading this divine consciousness throughout everything but i don't know i mean obviously i don't know i'm just this is just what i think what i'm thinking now right i mean i think that there's a lot of value getting into the meeting finally hey hi nancy <laughs> Okay. Hi, Nancy. Hi. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Nancy. I had a terrible time getting in. Well, you're finally here. That's right. Last shall be first. Uh, what? What'd you say? Last shall be first. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm still. I still have one question though about this thing about fear and separation. What is the What does the pathwork say about using the word evil? Not that the pathwork is saying evil that we think we have evil i mean that's a very strong word password doesn't say you have fear because you felt you separate you know you, you hit you hit that borderline and you separated into spots does it say anything using i mean not a description of evil but why that word why do we think we have we're, we're the darkness and evil well evil is equated with the lower self okay and the lower self I think in one point the guide says the the root of all evil is excessive self concern. Excessive what? Self concern. Aha. Uh -huh. And you know the apocryphal story of Lucifer being jealous of Christ and saying, "Hey, wait a second! You know I'm just as good. No, you're not. You know." And <laughs> all of a sudden, him being plunged into darkness. You know, I mean, the guy. There are two lectures about evil. Oh, there are. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I'll look them up. Central lectures, and okay. one of them says that there are three aspects of evil, and of, of which there are these are materialism. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, domination, and lies and confusion. Ah, I love. In other words, materialism is the focus on the material, uh, ignoring or side side stepping. Uh, the spiritual, denying the spiritual, um, the ability, desire to dominate others, have power over others, and then thirdly, the lies and confusion, half truths. Um, there's a second lecture on evil, also. Yes, this is this is Marion. I agree. Oh, what when I read this lecture for tonight, I knew I had to go to lecture 248 to read the pre, f three principles of the forces of evil, a uh, personification of evil. Uh, all of these lectures, as you put it on a desk, have little spokes coming out of it that have other lectures that clarify this one. So I think that's a very important point, is to have further clarification. It was very helpful to read the, that lecture. Yeah, and... Uh... So, I mean, evil, I suppose, is excessive self-concern, the basic bottom line concern with the self above all else. Separated that's self, you would say. The separated self, right? The that's idea of a separated self. Uh, right. And the denial of spirituality, the denial of spiritual reality. Um, yeah, well, that's where... Sorry for cutting you for cutting in, Alan, yeah, for a second. But, right. but yeah, all throughout the conversation between Kay's original question, which was fabulous, and also Tracy's initial answer, which was also fabulous, I found that both were kind of saying um, similar end games, but they were saying it. Those two systems or those two ways of thinking say it through a different identity about what you believe yourself to be. And if you identify with the individuated separate self, then yes, the teaching that teaches about an original choice is extremely beneficial because it teaches in the language of the separate self that there is a sense of self-responsibility for what is occurring within you. And then if you want to look at it from another level, once you've gotten, I, I've gotten far from there, but I believe once you've gotten to a place where you can resign or relinquish or get away, uh, let go, you know, your ego, and you 
you can transcend that by transcending each of the areas and acknowledging them like Pathwork says, you come to a place where what Tracy was saying was very, very much in line. It's, it's very much all according to the larger plan, but you have to be able to identify with that first. And it's, that's, it's hard to identify with the God self at times when we are so strongly in the midst of identifying with the ego. And so teachings that are based upon ego realness or ego, uh, not realness in the sense of, of, of infinite truth, but ego realness to how you perceive this world and you are placed in it are very useful then for that time period. Thank you, Kevin. Yes. Very, very nice. Thank well, I, re you. I remembered, I think I got the three principles of evil wrong. Materialism, the sec I think the second one is numbness and lack of control. Uh -huh. and the third is confusion and half truth. And when you think about it, that makes mm -hmm. a lot of numbness right. and lack of control is obviously responsible for much of the evil in the world. Certainly, lies are responsible for a lot of it too, and materialism. Um, but you know, I think it might be the right time to talk about the glorious, the gloriousness of being human. Um, this is a concept which I maybe borrow from the nuns back at uh, Anglican school, that the idea that there's something special about being a human being because of our struggle, in a sense that the angels, you know, I mean, they're fine and good. They're, they've, got it, they've got it together, but they have not gone through the transformation process of trying to recover and come back to the God self. They haven't fought the fight that we're fighting, so there's a certain glory in the, in the fight that we are engaged in. Hmm. So that, that ties into what we were talking about earlier, I think, about um, what, you, what you were saying, uh, Tracy, about Dorothy and why she had to go through the, uh, the whole experience um, to finally realize that she was in the right place from the beginning. Alan? Yeah. Since I'm kind of, you know, coming in as a newbie from being apart from this, um, I'm just wondering you know, and thinking about these, um, these evils. Um, so let's say I'm, I'm working with on peeling away the understanding of needing recognition and knowing that that's what keeps me separate. How would I work with that in the path work? Well, I think the question of that, the guide does address that, I think in the lecture, when he talks about the needs of the ego versus the needs of the, um, the greater self, talks about, you know, the recognition. Who's looking for the recognition? Is it, are you looking for it because you want to be prideful and, you know, vaunt yourself above, above other people? Or are you doing it because you want to be a link in the chain? You know, are you, are you, are you, rec are you creating, do you want recognition for the fact Actually, and I had a session with the guide, and, and the guy talked about my big problem, the idealized self-image. And he says, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be appreciated for what you give and who you are. What's wrong is if you want to be envied and admired. That's, that's the, the, the dark side of recognition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he talks about that uh, on page six. Giving to a cause beyond the little ego is the supreme satisfaction. So, you know, you could say that, hey, look, if you are aligned with that, with that desire, then that is the, all the recognition you need. And I think that that's why the Bible talks about the anonymous gift, the value of anonymous giving. There's some good passage in the Bible where basically, maybe it's Christ says, um, all giving, true giving should be anonymous. Mm -hmm. It's beautifully put because really there's nothing between, the only thing is it's you and God and the gift. No one needs to know about it. Um, so I'm thinking about that in, in reference to what you asked about, about recognition. Mm-hmm. So like, because I, I practice yoga, so it's kind of the idea of karma yoga doing for the sake of the action, not for the reward. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So is there also a, uh, like a practice that you would do, because you mentioned something about the gateways, which I'm not familiar with. Is that a pathways method of meditation? The gateways is a meditation about the positive aspect behind every negative aspect. Uh -huh. What the true essence, the positive essence of every negative manifestation is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how you go through the gateway of the, of the negative manifestation into its opposite, into the positive. So it's really a meditation. And um, I mean, the guide recommends the daily review exercise, you know, where you kind of look at what's disharmonious and difficult during the day. And then you look at those over a period of say several weeks or a month and you say, well, what are the things that are hanging me up and that are bothering me? And then go to guidance and say what the deeper meaning of it is. <laughs> Thank you. Tardia, anything to say? Good, morning, good afternoon, good evening. What are your thoughts? Hi. Well, I'm just really listening. Um, it's, uh, whenever it comes to it, you know, I always see that it's, uh, it's a lot of work, you know. In order to get to all those things, you have to keep on doing the daily reviews and looking at every detail, things that bother you, and then follow from there on. So it's like sometimes I just feel overwhelmed with, with all that work. In order, I know in order to get somewhere, I'll have to do the work, but there are days that I just don't wanna do it. You know, I distract myself other ways. Hey, everyone knows, knows it. I mean, believe me, it's not easy. And you know, that's another trick of the ego. On the one hand, to overemphasize how difficult it is, it's one of these paradoxical things that it's easy and difficult at the same time. But you know, when he says, the negativities must be fully seen in all their details, fear and shame of them must be overcome, hiding and camouflaging or whitewashing must have stopped. What is simply necessary is to honestly own up to the full force of devilish attitudes and all their puny details. Now that's kind of a tall order. Um, and, and I think that when the guide talks about in this lecture, the, uh, the closeness in the community, now that's really a prerequisite, I think, to owning up to some of these aspects. You know, it's only when we know each other and trust each other that we can come right out and say some of these things that are these very negative and difficult aspects that we're, we're you know, that we're grappling with. And if anybody wants to lay out any negative or difficult aspects, they're welcome to do that. <laughs> yes, say it now. Well, Tar Taria, one of the things that you said, I think, related to the effort, right, of, of, uh, I guess, remaining or finding your true self or cleansing maybe where you're at. And I mean, we all feel that way, definitely, Taria. In fact, I find myself, uh, I find myself confronted by that. I would say maybe once every two weeks or th even once every week, many times to a very strong level, because it's so important to me to want to, um, it feels very important to me. It feels like a calling or something to want to be, I guess, and, it, and this is where I think my ego gets involved, to be grander than I presently am. And uh, that's the downside of it, because in, in, in a sense, I've never really given up being my true self, um, even in my present state. Uh, that's always there. And so when I forget that, you know, who I really am and what's really within me in the light, sometimes I find the gentlest way to be with ourself is the most helpful. So when we're very judgmental about it's too hard, too much work to get a little progress, why is it always so much work, work, work? Well, what I say is really I go back to the, the point that I'm already, I'm already my true self. It's not something, not, none of my effort is going to make my true self more than what it always has been and always will be. Um, 
it's it's so much more i think a sense of forgiveness and a sense of reminding yourself when you know when i'm that judgmental that you know i it doesn't require that work in the moment just attend to what i know to be true uh, in this instant okay it's all self created it's all here within me you know I am my true self. And in that moment, a lot of that pain, that, that self-pressure that I put on myself for getting further ahead than where I am goes away because it's all kind of self-generated. It's all this extra, this extra, oh, I wish I knew all the lectures. Oh, I wish I had, or whatever. <laughs> so, you know, just, just really find that self-love because I lose it all the time. And then I just have to remind myself to give myself a hug and say, you know what? You're pretty damn great where you're at right now. Yeah. And yeah. You, don't need, yeah. you don't need to be good as Kevin. You're, 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 you're full of God's self, you know? <laughs> this is Mary, and I'd like to say something. Mm. Uh, brought up by what you're saying, Kevin, which is very, very important about that, uh, you know, loving oneself and being kind to oneself. And it brings up like what's in the lectures, and I don't remember because I don't have it written down in front of me, the three spheres of consciousness that the guide brings up, like how you are when you go into the individualized self, which is the psychology 101. You get born, you have these defenses, you act out your, your uh, idealized self-image and all of that. When in that sphere am I uh, bringing something to consciousness? Then the sphere of the higher self, lower self mask, that's a different sphere, and the guide uses the word sphere, because these are spheres of consciousness we move in and out of. How will I work you know, energetically and conceptually with the higher self, lower self mask, that sphere? The third sphere is the unitive state, where there's, no, there's not even any creation in it. This is all duality. It's, high, it's like always who you always were, just what you said, Kevin. You're always who you are, who you've always been, and will be now. So the what the guide gives us is in all these lectures how to know which sphere you're in, so how you would work energetically and conceptually in that those spheres. Because as I heard you describe it, Kevin, I could just feel you going in and out of this, which we all do all day long. But the guide gives us a roadmap, not intellectualizing, but a roadmap, where we are when. And that comes through intuition after studying all these lectures and, and other spiritual paths also. But thank you very much, because that is so important, those distinctions of, well, what sphere am I in? And what kind of support do I need while I'm in that one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, we're always going to forget, is my point. I mean... For forgetting our true self is natural in our present evolutionary identity. There is no guilt in the forgetting. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do is probably still my favorite thing to remind myself in the middle of all of that self-judgment. Yeah. Because everyone has forgotten. No one on this call <laughs> remembers, and I'm pretty cool with that. So it's just, it's like no one in my life remembers all the time. Nobody can. And so when we forget, just give yourself that big old hug, because I'm telling you, it's going to mean more than reading another lecture or doing another daily review, at least at that moment. That, that, that hug gets you back to where everything else becomes meaningful yeah. again. And that reminds me. Uh... Effective again. That reminds me of the guide's imperative to always ask for help, that we always forget. We can always forget that we can ask for help, not only to the spirits and other entities that are guiding us and that are not in the material world, but also to our friends and the folks on the path and people that know us well. And I, I'm, I'm just shocked sometimes at our unwillingness, reluctance to ask for help. It's very interesting how you ignore that and just pretend that it's not even there. This is uh, Alan. Hi, it's Stephen. I, I, well, I'd just like to add what you just said. Um, this, this asking for help, I, I tend to forget it, but when I do ask for help, I, I actually think I get help, but I don't recognize that I'm really being helped. For example, I kind of got out of New York right before the, the COVID started. And I think that was helpful. I did not recognize it. I almost feel that 
God should ring a bell and say, okay, I'm helping you now, listen up. <laughs> and I see how many times I've been helped and stay safe, just intuitively. And was I doing that, doing that or was it some kind of spirit or something above me, beyond me, that is helping me without my even being aware of it? So I, I think that's an important point. The other point is this concept between fear and, and evil. Um, fear certainly is dominant in my life. I don't experience the evil that much, maybe on <laughs> certain occasions. But certainly fear and this whole concept of just opening up to it, whatever it is, whether it's fear, anger, revenge, just being with it and welcoming it in, it's hard to do. Uh, I want to go into my head and ruminate about it. But if I could just experience it and see where I hold it, how I hold it, whatever it might be, the fear, anger, revenge, whatever, it starts to dissolve. It's only when I push it away that I start blaming others. So I think that's a very important point. And I think I kind of recall that in this lecture. Um, so that's what my feelings are. Mm -hmm. Sure. Beverly, do you have thoughts? Beverly? Yeah, I had to unmute. Oh. Um, yeah. Um, let me see my note. The one thing I was I was thinking about <clears throat> when they talk, the pathwork always talks about how important it is to be aware of your thoughts and to take total responsibility for the circumstances that you're in. Um, so I was wondering, once you get to the point where you really recognize all the negative thoughts, evil thoughts, then what? I mean, is it grace that gets you out of it? Or is there something that you do? I mean, you don't do anything to make it change, do you? I think that's a question right right up your alley, Marion. Uh, what? Right, did you but, hear Billy's question? Yes. Can you repeat? Can you say it again? Oh, I was. It's that. Sure. Uh, go ahead. Oh, okay. What What I was saying is that the, the pathwork talks about the, the, how necessary it is to take full responsibility for all your thoughts and feelings, and according to this lecture, all the negativity, all the jealousy, all the anger, all the pride, all those negative ideas. So once you are really clear and you're watching yourself do evil things, n evil thoughts, you know, according to the definition of evil that Alan gave, then what? <laughs> is it grace well, that gets you out of it or is there some? Yes, yes, yes. And, and everybody has their own description of grace, but you're, you're absolutely right. Because grace is when you open up to what is always there for you, where you are loved so unconditionally, and you are embraced by this, whatever you want to call it, that has no name, and we give it names, God, the beloved, whatever what name we give that. When you open up and you let down all defenses, and you open up to that beauty of being held and given to, you are then inspired intuitively as to what you step into next and that is grace and grace supersedes karma there's no karma when you're in grace and if we, we all know what karma is the law is cause and effect when you're in grace it supersedes karma and so therefore therefore it behooves us to have a whatever you want to call it a god higher self whatever that the pathwork says it's principal and personal, not a person, personal. And when that, that develops through meditation, through prayer, through energy work, releasing, held cellular memory, cellular memory, a lot of us is unconscious still, then, then what happens, you can go into the darkest of the dark side, but as the guide said, never without the hand of God. And that's a metaphor. So your hand of God may be different than mine. I do my daily prayers, but we maybe could have some 
like mine, I'm not going to go into it at length, but the one I've been working on is those that I love the most. I have a daughter, a son, four grandsons. I mean, I have gone to the darkest, darkest, dark side because they aren't showing, not because of the pandemic, but because of the stage they're in in their lives. None of them are showing up the way I want them to be. And these are wonderful, beautiful God people. But I, I had such, I've had such darkness to go through where I don't know where it's going to lead. I don't know. All I know is that greater than love is obedience to God. What's obedience? Listen to your intuition. Greater than obedience is surrender. So these are just words, but to make them alive, you need to find out what they are, because you're absolutely right. It's the grace of God. And when I know I'm holding the hand of God constantly, constantly, I can go through, I want to kill them all off. I've wanted to shoot them. I've wanted to um, punish them. I, and I don't mean I'm not kidding. I am not kidding. But only can I do that because I know how much I am loved, not every moment. And that I've got a hand guiding me through that. And I don't know where it's going to lead. And every time I jump to the end result, I get told, come back into the moment. So I won't, will not tell you the miracles that come up that I could never think up of. I won't even go into it all. Of things that have showed up that I could never even imagine for this change in my life with these because I know I'm being taken through, detaching from anybody and anything that is my source other than God. Anything. And the deepest karmic connections are parents and children. Then I got grandchildren. So I've been given the intuitive sense I am being taken through unwinding phase of all attachments to anything, anybody other than my God self. But that didn't come up immediately. But all all intelligence will come through with deepening of that connection. And you're very right. That word grace is so powerful. So I'll end it with that because that's a little personal. I'm letting in a little bit my process. Mm. It's been intense. And I still don't know where it's all going, but it's dark. It's dark. But I know I'm loved. I know I'm loved through all this. So it's so important to know that we are loved by this personal God not a person. Hmm. Wow. Oh, uh, thank you, Marianne. Thank that, you. that ties exactly in with what my first question was, which is that apparently you do have, in fact, I know it too, Marianne, because I'm going through it as well, that apparently you really have to face sometimes things that in yourself, if not outside, that are really ugly, very, very ugly. Hmm. But I think at least for me and Marianne, I think you were saying that, and I really appreciate it, that that has to be done. And it, it does take you sometimes away from people and away from, you, you, just, you just have to be on the right path. And I really appreciate you saying that you hold the hand of God or the hand of, of, of your own goodness. Yeah. You know, not denying your own goodness while you're looking at your own ugliness. Exactly. I think that's the direction. But yes, not denying and, your own goodness. And, and, and what my inner God self said to me a long time ago is that, because I was looking for, like, you know, how do you love God? You love God by loving those you don't love. You love God by, you know, all these various ways that you love God. But what was missing for me, there was something missing. And I meditated on that. Something's missing. And then the next day I opened this book, and there was from what, something that my master said, the way to love me is to know that I love you. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh my And goodness. I just, I got chills. I just shifted. It just, oh. So then if I, you know, what can I do to really open my channels to know I am loved? So when I go through the dark side, I'm in that tunnel with no curve in the tunnel. I have, you know, I got my little pocket flashlight with me. And then I see there's other people in the tunnel with me. And have a little fun while I'm in there. And I never, never let go that hand. Oh, that was beautifully, beautifully. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh -huh. I mean, it, it's also, of course, 
uh, when you do feel the negativity, it's helpful to see how it works. The recognition of negativity helps diffuse it and make situations better. Absolutely. If you have negativity mm. at work and you say, hey, look, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go with that temptation to um, do something negative, like to collude with somebody at work. Uh, and you know, your ego kind of wants to do, take a negative step, but then your, your greater self, you know, you're prepared to go, to go a different way. And then you see how that works out to your benefit. In other words, this concept of taking self-response, taking responsibility for negativity, you know, the idea that, hey, you know, I do have negative intent. There is a very good lecture about that negative intentionality, 195. That's a very, very valuable lecture. That's actually the first lecture I went to to see Eva uh, manifest the guide, that live lecture. But the idea that, I mean, the politicians, it's, it's amusing, I think, that when you see people go, I take full responsibility, you know, like what exactly does that mean? You know, I've never really understood what that means. <laughs> in, in the path work, what it means is that you feel the pain of what it has manifested in your life and you are prepared to give it up. That's what taking responsibility means for, for negativity in the path work. Hmm. Nancy, what are your thoughts? Um, I don't have a lot of thoughts right now. <laughs> Okay. So I'm in the past, but thank you for asking, Alan. I, I want to also mention something else that I, I read. If it's okay? Yeah. Sure, come on. Um, somewhere, I guess in the beginning, they, they were talking about the experience of love and, and what they seem to be saying is, that until you reach a certain, I guess, level of consciousness, that love is just an idea. Is that, do you, do you know what I'm talking about? I think that the guide, I think that what that meant or what he was saying was that if you, if you try to talk about love from a superficial level, it feels superficial. Mm. It, it's, about, it's about whether you can feel it deeply or not. And that's a choice, I think. Uh, you, what do you think, uh, Tracy, does that, the concept of, of how you feel love and whether it's superficial or whether it's really strongly felt? It is referred to in this lecture, that's, that's right. But what are you asking me, Ellen? It, what I think about the concept of, of, of uh, can, can, I'm not sure what you're asking me about that. I understand, it, it, you know, there's, it, it's in the lecture, the guy talks about, um, let me try to find it. Something about um, in the beginning. Is it? Yeah, I think it's in the beginning. That's right. And I think that the na he does say something about the nature of love, right? In the lecture, I think it's in the beginning. I don't remember that. Yeah, I do. Uh-huh. Oh, here it is. On, in page two? Yes. Can you read it, Beverly? Uh, sure. I think. In that state of separation, the word love is empty of feeling and experience, a word merely bandied about. Worse, it is misused, and one speaks about love when many other things are meant that have little or nothing to do with real love. When you experience fully the inner meaning of love, you will know that everything is contained in that word. So that last sentence is what I was wondering about. How, how, it just sounds silly to say, but how do you know when you fully experience everything is contained in that word? Well, that's when you're in the unitive state. Oh, okay. Um. You know. That's why I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there we are. Uh, 
Yeah, um, but you know, the guy of course, uh, love is bandied about a lot, isn't it? And uh, people say love, and it means almost everything else, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes. I love that uh, what the guide says in that paragraph about um, the spiral configuration, level by level, until the circles in the spiral become smaller and smaller. Yeah, yeah Alan. Alan's Joel. Joel, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah. Hi, Joel. Hi, Joel. Hey, yeah, Joel. I've been, been listening. I, I wanted to go back to what Beverly was saying because I think that all of us have experienced the unitive state and that we we may not recognize it because we didn't know that that's what it was and also because it may be so fleeting and that we are almost i guess maybe it's our lower self or yeah our ego is afraid to acknowledge it because it's so powerful. But I'll just give a simple example. Let's say that you are, are looking at your child, right? Or, or it could be any child. You know, I'm thinking of Beverly at work. You know, she works with a lot of children. And, and I, I would imagine that there are times when this, this, this love pours out, right? Where we, we're just connected with the love that is the love of the infinite that's always a part of us and and it comes out but we don't we don't identify it or you know, associate with it if you will right because we know it's it it is us but it's so much more grand than us and so we don't see it do you know what i'm saying alan and and, and you know it's like when you see your mother sitting maybe your mother's asleep on the couch and and you just feel like, oh, oh mom, I, I, I just love you so much. You know, you, you, you've done so much for me. I, at least for me, you know, when I've had those experiences. And, and, and it could be in meditation when it's just the silence, right? When there's no thought at all. Um, so I, I think that we want to give ourselves more credit. That I, I believe that except for those of us that are maybe very damaged and are more looking to receive love and we really need a lot of healing and even maybe those people also have these glimpses and and so i, I would just encourage everybody to think about that and see if that isn't true well that's being in the state of love that's what you're saying without the ego mediating it yeah, the true, the true state that, that the guide is talking about here, not romantic love, you know, I want you to want me or, you know, you know, we're, you know, we're going to become complete together and, you know, become one, but, you know, not, not that type of love. It, it just is other, I have the form of love that really defies words, I think, you know? Yes. Yeah, from what you said, uh, Joel, <clears throat> it's it's as if that just comes up wherever it comes from. But you, you, we don't we don't identify it as love. We have this wonderful feeling, looking at a child, holding. I had my niece's child on on my chest one one day. She was crying, and I put her on my chest, and it was the most comforting thing in the whole world that I was comforting her. And she was totally relaxed into me. And that, that it comes up. It's just there. You're in the presence, yes. you're in the presence of love. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And Beverly, I, do you relate to that with the children that you work with? Yeah, sometimes they're just so cute, you just can't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and a lot of it, I think that love is when it comes up in you at the same time as you're seeing it in a, with another. It comes up, it's really in us, but it's because we're with another. It's not, you know, yeah. You know, I always thought of that just as appreciation or getting a kick out of their cuteness. It, it just sounds so much nicer to think of it as 
presence of love, that just sounds nicer. <laughs> It feels nice. It is nice. It, 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 it's recognizing an important moment. Yeah. Instead of that, oh, just can't, you know, it, we, if we catch ourselves, we recognize an important element, not only in the child or whatever, but in ourselves. Yeah. No, I really do appreciate that. Thank, thank you. you, Joel. You're welcome. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, Joel. Good seeing you all. Good to be here. I'm here, I'm just not <laughs> visible. <laughs> Any other thoughts? You know, I was um, thinking about some of the meditations that Mendek Rubin wrote down. I remember, of course, Marion, you know, you remember Mendek. Sure. Uh, who was a uh, Pathwork uh, helper in the early inner circle with Eva. And um, he wrote down some beautiful meditations, which are very applicable, I think, to this lecture. And I um, grabbed some of them. I downloaded some, and I'm going to send you a couple files. And I think this ought to work with the, uh, the file. I'm going to see if I can grab a couple files from the, from the computer. And I, I'd like you to have these, and I'm going to read them because I think they're very uh, relevant to this lecture. Yeah, he wrote a small book of meditation. Okay, here we go. Now, did anyone get those files? Let's see. Where oh, would I get them? To, hold on, stand by. I'm going to send them to everyone. Let's see. Oh, I see. Now I got it. I got it. All right, did so you everybody I, get that file? Can we yeah. open it? Can yeah. we open it? Downloading it now. Oh yeah. What do I do with it? I haven't. Oh, you can put it on your computer. Oh, I didn't. Get, I didn't. Oh. Get, it disappeared from me. Oh. I'm sending yeah. you two files. One is called "Just Ordinary." Uh, let's see. One is called "Just Ordinary" and "Just Ordinary Two." Alan, where would you find that? Where would I find it? I am not sure. Where did other people get it? In their emails? In chat. Oh, oh in you chat. got it in chat. Oh, I didn't go into chat. Yeah, oh. in chat on the side it says. Okay. That's two files. There we are. Yeah. Okay, yeah. got it. I didn't get it. You have to click the... Um... You got to click on the oh. icon. Oh, I got it. Thank you. Thank you. And where will it show up on the screen if I download? It's on the right hand of the screen if you're on a desktop, if you're on, I'm sorry, if you're on a PC or a laptop, it should be on the right hand side. Yeah, but is that, you, oh, go ahead. Is that where it will appear? I'm downloading it now, but where will it appear after I download it? In your downloads. Oh, oh. I don't know. I want to read, uh, I want to read one of these. <laughs> okay, okay, do that. Because I, I can't get okay. to it. I'm giving up. I'm going to read uh, his second meditation. Were I satisfied to be just ordinary, it's called. Were I satisfied to be just ordinary, I could be in reality. Were I satisfied to be just ordinary, I could stop running. Were I satisfied to be just ordinary, I could give up my envy. Were I satisfied to be just ordinary, I could give up my hate. Were I satisfied to be just ordinary, I could grow up. Were I satisfied to be just ordinary, I could stop grabbing. Were I satisfied to be just ordinary, I could be peaceful and happy. Mm. Were I satisfied to be just ordinary, I could give up my fear of moving out. Were I satisfied to be just ordinary, I could look people in the eye. 
were I satisfied to be just ordinary, I could be godlike. Mm. Mm. Amen. Yeah. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you. And um, shall I read the uh, second meditation or rather? Yeah, sure. sure. It's called Just Ordinary. After, after pondering the fact that I'm ordinary, I see myself smelling a lovely rose. After visualizing a beautiful golden sunset, I see myself just ordinary. After pondering the fact that I am ordinary, I see myself singing in the shower. After visualizing an exquisite butterfly, I see myself just ordinary. After pondering the fact that I'm ordinary, I see myself greeting an old friend. After visualizing a peaceful seashore, I see myself just ordinary. After pondering the fact that I am ordinary, I see myself swimming in the ocean. After visualizing a high majestic mountain, I see myself just ordinary. After pondering the fact that I am ordinary, I see myself strolling in an open meadow. After visualizing God in heaven, I see myself just ordinary. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. It's kind of deep. And it's maybe, all so humble. Yes, yes. And maybe if you're just ordinary, you're actually claiming your greatness. Yeah. This is Marion. It reminds me of the. Do you know that story? And you can Google it. And you get many, many versions of the girl, the person, the water bearer carrying the two jugs up the path to the to the mistress to bring water from the well up the road. And one of them has a crack in it. One of the water jugs, and it loses water all along the way. And 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 then the the water bearer has to come down sooner to get more water because it's lost half of its water. But the other one doesn't have a crack in it does the right thing but the one says i feel so bad because you're you're going up and down the hill so many times because my i got a crack i got a crack then the water bear says did you notice on your side of the path all of those flowers i planted seeds on that side and when the water leaks from your jug because you've got a crack in it it's watered all those flowers you'll notice there aren't flowers on the other side of the road and so i picked those flowers to take them to the mistress's house and so they left. So it was such a wonderful story. It's online. It's Google. You know the broken, the cracked water jug, but it's so beautiful. It's how the crack in us is used for divine uh, purpose. Yes. Yeah. It's beautiful. I had, I had excuse me, this Stephen. I had read somewhere in line with what was just said. It is through our cracks that the sunshine comes in. Ah, very nice. Yeah, Leonard Cohen sings about that, yeah. Oh, I love him. <laughs> <laughs> I, just today, I listened to Hallelujah three times. <laughs> Leonard Cohen's song, Hallelujah. Uh -huh. Yeah, right, incredible. right. Incredible. So shall we have our meditation, my friends, or...? Sure. Want to say yeah. yeah. Right. So we're going to have, let's have a 15 minute meditation. Great. And I'll mute everybody. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I'll come to you very briefly. So let's meditate about this uh, concept of claiming our greatness.
fine. Okay. All right. You, you do have clips. They're in your bag.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Much love to all. Thank you, Alan. Much love to everybody. Thank you, thank Alan. You, Alan. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you Tracy. You're welcome. And thank you for the, to the whole group. Welcome, thank, you. Is, thank you. This is yeah, thank this you. is Ellen. Thank you all. Oh, hi, Ellen. Hi, Ellen. Thank you to the oh, whole group. Yeah, I've been I've been listening in. I I was feeling kind of under the weather today, so I just have been listening. But I really received a tremendous amount. So thank you, all of you. Well, Tracy and I will be picking our next lecture. Okay. See you in about three weeks, I guess, three or four weeks. Yep. Okay. Sounds Thank wonderful. You. Thank you. See you then. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Thank everybody. you very much. Good night, Thank you, everyone. Tracy. So, so nice to be able to see people. Really. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Bye. Good night, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.